I decided that I wouldn't smuggle anymore after the murders, and I told Mick still I no longer want him to smuggle, but I was quite happy to purchase drugs just for my friends and that, you know? I never had nothing to do with smuggling because I don't know if it was my own personal fears and they realise I'm a weakling, but they got more friendly towards me. I was just about to get in the bath when I heard the bell go. Almost jumped out of my skin. Since the murders, I've been convinced the old Bill were going to be around at any time. When I opened up, I saw that it was Matty, this young gypsy bloke who I'd seen around town. It was a real relief, but not for long. Someone told me you're looking to buy a shotgun, he said. I've got one in my van. This was fucking tricky. You have to remember that at the time, every single newspaper, every magazine, every TV bulletin and radio broadcast is about these three local blokes who've been brutally murdered, blasted in their car by some bloke with a shotgun. And then you have to remember that up until the day before that, I'd been asking everyone I knew, I mean everyone, to get me a gun. I was really desperate for it. But now, the gun had arrived. What I wanted to say was, no thanks mate, I don't need it anymore. But that would have been a bit of a giveaway. Okay, I said, great, I'll have a look. I went to the bloke's van and he opened up the back to show me this nine shot single barrel pump action shotgun with three cartridges, all in a brown plastic case. He wanted £350 for it. So I told him I'd have to call up a mate to check if the price was right. I slipped back indoors and phoned Mick. He agreed that the best way to avoid suspicion was to go ahead and buy it. And he promised he'd pay me back right away. As soon as Matty was out of sight, I drove straight over to Meadow Cottage. Mick wasn't around, so I took the gun and hid it in the barn behind some bamboo poles. Eventually, Mick turned up and I told him what I'd done and followed him into the barn. What happened next, I will never forget. Mick took the gun out of the case, took out the three cartridges and slowly pushed them one by one into the magazine of the gun. Then he started playing around with it tossing it from one hand to another to test its weight and balance. The gun was spinning all over the place, but every now and again, it ended up pointing directly at my head. And all the time I was standing there thinking, Fuck, how did I let myself get into such a stupid situation? Eventually, Mick unloaded the gun, put it back into his case. It was only when I got back into my van to drive home, I couldn't get the key into the ignition, that my hands were shaking so much, that I realised just how scared I'd been. I'm sitting alone on the sofa in my living room watching some crappy TV show when I hear a car pull up outside. At first I think it's my neighbours getting back from work but as I listen I realise that the footsteps on the gravel are making their way towards my front door. I sit there waiting for the sound of the bell but it never comes. Instead there's this horrible racket, this crashing, tearing sound of wood splitting and glass shattering. The kick in the door down, smashing the way in. Before I've had a chance to react, I hear them running through the house, knocking stuff over, throwing things against the wall, and screaming out my name over and over again. I want to run away, to hide, anything, but I'm frozen to the spot with fear. And the noise and the stamping and the screaming goes on and on, and gets louder and louder, until finally the door to the front door bursts open, and Mick and Jack are standing there, and their faces are both covered in streaks of blood and they have shotguns in their hands. As they see me, they start laughing harder and harder. Then they raise their guns so they level with my head and I see their fingers tighten on the triggers. And then there's this blinding flash. And then I wake up. It was more than a month after the murders, but the nightmares were still as vivid as ever. So bad that I was almost afraid to go to sleep at night. For obvious reasons, I'd be doing my level best to avoid Mick and Jack. I stopped selling drugs, I'd been working all hours to keep myself occupied and basically stayed away from places where I knew they might go. Mick, clever git, sent over some really expensive Christmas presents for my kids and invited me and my wife over for lunch. Short of telling Sandra the truth, something I just couldn't do, there was no way to explain to her why I didn't want to go. She was always into being polite and proper. If someone did something nice to you, it was only right to go and thank them. I will never forget the day. The kids were running around in Mickey's garden, chasing after rabbits and having the time of their lives. 
Sandra was having a good old smoking and drinking session with Jackie Street. Mick was pissing about with his new toy, a radio controlled plane, and I was standing around like a prat, stone cold sober, desperate to be anywhere but there. After that, I didn't see Mick again until the new year. He'd ring me up every now and again, and then asked me to do some electrical work or some other building work at his house. And like some spineless dog, I'd always say yes. I felt pretty shit every time, but the truth is, I just didn't know what else to do. In my mind, I was as guilty of the murder as anyone else. If it ever came on top, all it would take would be for one of them to say that I knew all about it and agree to drop them off and pick them up afterwards, and that would be it. I'd be doing life right alongside them. But the more I saw Mick after the murders, the less I believed that he would ever stitch me up like that. He wasn't the same person anymore. Whenever we were alone together, he'd start trying to justify the killings to me. He'd start off by saying her all three of them were scum and that he'd done the world a favour. Then he'd talk about the facts that even Sarah Saunders, even though she'd lost the father of her kid, was much happier now that Pat was dead. He told me that when the police had questioned Sarah, they'd asked her if she knew anyone who might want Pat dead. She said she didn't. Then they said, well do you know anyone who might want Pat dead? Because they found out he was informing on them. Mick was also convinced that Pat was a grass, and finally through Sarah, he'd got confirmation. You see Darren, that's another reason to have killed the Another time, he started talking about how the police were saying they had no idea who was behind the murder. I tell you what Darren, you could look in the phone book and just pick a name out at random, and I bet you find someone who wanted all three of them dead. No one is going to miss them at all. But it was all talk. Deep down, Mick was really bothered about what he'd done. Before the murder, when I was working at his house, I'd always suggest going out for a couple of pints at lunchtime, but he'd always refuse, saying it was better to work through and get everything done. After the murder, we'd do a couple of hours work and then he'd literally drag me to the nearest pub as soon as it opened and we'd spend the rest of the day there getting pissed. And it didn't just happen once or twice, it happened every single time I saw him. Jack, on the other hand, didn't seem to have changed at all. I found that really scary. It wasn't just what Mick had said about the cold-hearted way he'd carried out the murders, though I couldn't get the image of Jack as a robotic killing machine out of my mind. There was just something about him that gave me the creeps. Although we never really admitted it, the two of us never really got on from the time we first met at Hollinsley Bay. Jack loved Mick to bits and would do absolutely anything for him, but me, he didn't seem to have any time for, and the feeling was completely mutual. We'd had a few laughs over the years, and we were always pretty nice to each other whenever we met, but the truth was, I trusted Jack exactly about as far as I could throw him. Around the middle of February, on one of those days when we should have been working, but went to the pub instead, Mick and I started talking about flying. I don't remember how it started, but we ended up having this friendly argument about how easy it was to navigate from the air. I was saying that it couldn't be that hard, because you'd be able to recognise fields and roads and buildings. Mick was saying it was really difficult, and that I probably couldn't even recognise my own house from the air. I'd never been in any kind of plane in my life, so when Mick started saying, let's put it to the test, why don't you come flying with me next week? I started to get really excited, and then told him I'd love to. Let's agree then. Mick said, you and me up in a plane next weekend and we see how well you do. I thought it was just a beer talking but the following weekend Mick phoned me up and said we ran for my flying lesson in half an hour. I was at the door within seconds of the bell ringing and when I tugged it open there was Mick and there was Jack standing right beside him. Ready for your flying lesson? asked Mick. I looked at the two of them again. Is Jack coming as well then? I said. Mick looked over at Jack then back at me. Don't worry, he said. He can sit in the back. Silence. And then I took a deep breath. Actually, I can't today after all. I forgot that I promised Sandra I'd take the kids out to the pictures. They're almost ready to leave. Uh, maybe some other time? As they walked away, I don't mind telling you that I was absolutely shitting myself. Maybe I was just being paranoid. Maybe it would have just been fine. When I told Sandra about it, she said I was stupid. Knowing how much I'd always wanted to go flying... But the fact was that Jack had turned up really scared me. Up until then, Mick and Jack had only used me because of my skill as an electrician or to move drugs for them. Going flying would have been the first time ever that they wanted to do something with me purely for pleasure. And that just didn't feel right. I was pretty sure the only lesson I would have got was in free fall parachute jumping without the parachute. After that, my relationship with Mick started to get more and more strained. And by the beginning of March, any change in his personality seemed to have faded away completely. 
I was still working for him, doing up his house and stuff, but he never had time to take me to the pub anymore. Sometimes, he'd even forget to pay me. I knew he was planning to start smuggling again, having hooked up with some bloke called Russell, and I was getting more and more tense waiting for him to call me and ask me to join in. I'd already made up my mind that I was never ever going to do it again, and now I had the perfect excuse. My one year passport had run out, but I was still worried about how he'd react. The day I told him about it, there was this long, awkward silence on the other end of the phone. Eventually, Mick just said, OK, and put the phone down. Instantly, I felt like this huge weight had been lifted off my shoulders. The work on the bungalow was finished, and I was able to go abroad, and I no longer had any real use as far as Mick was concerned. He dropped me like a stone, and I was more happy for him to let me go. I felt like this was going to be the end of it. Then, out of the blue... Something happened which completely turned my life around. Suddenly, I was desperate to spend as much time with Mick as possible. Not only that, but I also wanted to return to the drug business. I wanted Mick to sell me all the puff he could get his hands on. The first time he spoke to me, I almost cacked my pants. I was in a sailing oak pub having a quick drink when I thought I felt someone tap me on my shoulder. I was going to ignore it when I heard a voice say, I know you're a drug dealer. In the instant it took me before I turned around, all kind of things were going through my head. I was wondering if the person was definitely talking to me, whether anyone else had heard. Most of all though, I was wondering who the f*** it might be. I was really, really hoping that it might be one of my old customers, or some old friend with a big mouth. Someone stupid. Someone I could just tell to piss off. And then I turned around, and I saw Detective Constable Jim standing next to me, with a big smirk on his face. There and then, I wanted the ground to open up and swallow me whole. Anywhere but there was where I wanted to be. This was really bad. Really, really bad news. I'd never spoken to Jim, but I knew who he was because I'd passed across twice before. The first time was in the same pub about a month or so before the murders when someone pointed him out as a copper who had lent his car, an XR3i, to three of his mates who were going out on a pub crawl. They'd written it off, naturally, one of them ended up in intensive care. We were all talking about it in the pub, and I said something like, Now, not much of a detective, is he? We couldn't see that one coming, is he? Jim was standing right next to me at the time, but he never said anything. He just looked really pissed off and a bit embarrassed. The second time was outside the Sailing Oak, just after Christmas, when I saw him unloading a load of bottles of spirits in the back of his car and taking them into the pub. I remember asking someone later what he was up to, and they said that the landlord was a mate of his, and Jim had managed to sort him out some cheap booze from one of the police auctions. So there I was, in the pub with his copper, and he was looking at me straight in the eye, and accusing me of being a drug dealer. And I was desperately trying to think of something to say, when he started up again. I suppose you're going to deny it, he said. Everyone always denies it. Double fuck. He'd taken the words right out of my mouth, but I thought I might as well say it anyway. I don't know what you're talking about, I said. All that was a long time ago. You're out of date, mate. And then I walked off. Two days later, Jim phoned me up on my mobile, having got the number from my boss, who it turned out was a mate of his. I'm only telling you this because you're a friend of Dave, he said. You're about to get spun. The drug squad is planning a raid on your place because they reckon you've got a load of gear stashed away. I just laughed. I didn't think the drug squad were that slow. I've told you, mate, that's all in the past. He didn't care. I'm telling you, Darren, you're going to get spun this week, any day now. There's a note here on the office wall. I'm looking at it right now. I tell you what though, if you're telling me the truth and you've not got it anymore, well I might be able to stop it. I'll have a word with some people, see what I can do. A few days after that, Jim phoned me up again. See, I stopped it from happening. You didn't get spun after all. I think we should meet up because you owe me a beer. Even I could see right through this one. It had to be just about the oldest trick in the book. Okay, this bloke was a copper and obviously knew quite a bit about me but I was pretty certain that I was never about to get spun. He just made the offering up to get me to believe I owed him, and now he wanted me to meet up so we could call in the favour. It crossed my mind that it might be some kind of ploy the police were using to try to find out about the rest of the murders, but the more I thought about it, the less likely it seemed. I'd been reading the papers and watching stuff on the TV, and it seemed pretty clear from what the police were saying that they didn't have a clue who was responsible for the killings. The list of suspects who might have had a grudge against Tate and the others seemed to stretch all the way to the west coast. They'd even interviewed the parents of Leah Betts. The only way they would get onto me would be through Mick or Jack, and I knew neither of them had been picked up, so I had to be in the clear. 
In the end, I was so intrigued by the whole thing, I decided to let my curiosity get the better of me and meet up with Jim, after all. As it happens, it wasn't at all what I expected a cop to be like. But then again, I'd never been friends with a policeman in my entire life. We had a few drinks and a bit of a laugh, and I found I was really enjoying myself in a funny sort of way. We had quite a lot in common. But as he told me more than once, as the beers started to disappear, he had an excellent arrest rate. It turned out that Jim was a bit of a maverick who was always getting into trouble with his bosses for not doing things quite by the book and was basically one of the most successful detectives in the whole of Essex.